But welcome. We are in the regenerative agriculture session of the Indiana Small Farm Conference. This is my name is Tamara Benjamin. There's Nick, Joanne, thank you, Richard Perkins, and we should have Liz Brownlee in the barn, it looks like, Liz. <laughs> Okay, um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna put up each of your slides as uh, as we go along. I'm gonna start out with, um, uh, let's see if I can pull up Joanne's. Joanne and Paul Mosier own Holy Cow uh, Farm. They're in Monon, Indiana. They produce beef, pork, lamb, and they've been direct to market um, farming from since 1994. So go for it. Okay, so um yeah paul and i uh actually paul bought our first farm when we were seniors in high school so we're high school sweethearts and uh he was he wanted to be a farmer and he started out as a corn and soybean farmer um and so that's just what you do we bought a bunch of old equipment basically salvaged stuff and he started doing corn and soybeans just traditional cropping um after we got married we bought a cow and um so we started doing um uh, beef. And then uh, after a while, um, we realized we weren't making any money. And so uh, it, that was a problem. <laughs> um, and so we were always throwing money at the black hole. And it's, I, we loved farming. We were um, basically, uh, our grandparents had farmed, but we were the first ones our parents didn't farm. So we were kind of a skip generation. So we had to start from scratch. Um, and the so what we did um we weren't making money so we said well we've got to do something different we had um about 172 acres that we owned um or were buying and um the farms that were north of us um around that time that we started looking at other options options that would go well that were regenerative regenerative um the farms around us were selling for about ten thousand to fourteen thousand dollars an acre and we said whatever we do we've got to be competitive with this because corn and soybeans weren't doing it. Um, and so we decided, hey, let's just start turning everything into grass and let's start grazing it. It seems like that seems like the most logical thing to do. It's a natural way of doing things, why not? Um, and so we started putting up fences while our neighbors were tearing them down, we started putting fences up and uh, we started planting grass. And uh, so we started, just bit by bit because we cash flowed all of this so um it had to be practical and so we started with 20 acres 10 acres and then 20 acres and then we went to 40 and then we took our whole 100 acres here at our home ranch and turned it all into grass and so we got cattle and then more cattle and then sheep and pigs and we just started adding to it so our first step basically was to grow grass and that might sound simple but it's not always simple. Um, and so um, that's that's just what we started doing. Um, and we did a diversity of species. Um, evidently, Paul's really good at growing grass. Um, but we noticed our biggest thing um, for us when we started going from conventional farming to growing grass was that um, the quality of the seed made a huge difference. So we grew grass. Um, so we just consider those our solar panels that we can harvest the sun's energy um and so then we decided to turn that energy into something useful and we started grazing it and so the the cows and the sheep they started uh <laughs> they started eating everything and then they're recycling nutrients and it was it was just it's awesome it's just nothing like watching animals graze it's peaceful it's relaxing and so but the thing was to have the farm we had to turn that that grazing power into um into something to make a, a living off of so then we started feeding um families so we turned we became an official um uh, we started let's see in the late 90s there we started doing um uh, holes halves and quarters of offering beef and stuff but in 2012 we started going really wild and harvested a beef and a pig put them in our freezer and just started selling direct market and so since then we've been doing um direct marketing to basically feed families with our um, with the protein that we grow on the farm. And so it's it's been working beautifully. Um, it's something we can raise our whole family on, plus feed other families. And um, I just love I just love working with the people. That's the fun part. So we're we're restoring the land, we're we're adding beauty to it, and we're feeding families. So it's just like a triple win, but it isn't always easy. So 
<laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, that was Joanne Mosier, and we are going to go to Richard Perkins next. Richard, I know you don't have slides, so if you want to just, uh, you've got a whole bunch of slides in, a, in an hour or so. If you want to tell us a little bit about your farm, Richard Perkins comes from Ridgedale Farm in Varmland, Sweden. Um, so it's the night, it's getting towards the nighttime for him. He's the author of Regenerative Ag. He's our keynote speaker coming up. Um, does a lot of permaculture, farming design strategies, capitalizing on patterns and resilient features and of natural systems. So go for it, Richard. But we're up at 59 degrees north in Sweden. So that's pretty extreme farming climate. We have about three months frost free, plus or minus about 20 days. It's a very small farm. We're focused on how to make small profitable farms, which everyone told us was crazy in an economy and regulated country like Sweden. We're about 32 acres, mostly forestry, but it's about 11 acres of pasture that we derive most of our profit from. And we bought this farm for about $100,000 so eight years ago now and spent just a little more than that implementing these systems. We've based it around perennial systems, trees and grass, but they don't necessarily pay back so quickly. And over the last seven years, we've basically 3D printed this onto the landscape based around a key line layout. Key line's been a very big part of my design career work. And we put in agroforestry systems to create the bones of the farm system. There's about $30,000 of crops up above the pasture, not really taking up any room. And then we run our animals in between. So it gives a framework for, for the layout of the farm that makes water do a lot more work. And then between those alleys, we pull a key line plow, which is just a, a highly uh, optimal subsoiler and during the short time as videos here I'll skip through them we've built about 10 inches of active topsoil and seen amazing results in our pasture we had a record 150 year drought two years ago where people were selling off half their beef herds because there was going to be no winter forage and we still had grass up to my shoulders in full rampant reproduction and we've done that through the key line plow and through having very dense amount of animals in a very small space and it's the reason I've become a poultry expert is not that I particularly love raising chickens but for a small farmer they're the most effective livestock because of the density that you can have on a farm. So we focus on pastured broilers which remain an excellent um, enterprise for cash flow looking at different models for raising those effectively, including what's become Europe's uh, cheapest approved slaughtery so that we can process the birds and make the money for the work we do on the farm. We do some amount of pasture turkeys as well. And then we developed eggmobiles that are suited to our climate here that are built out of very cheap materials, simple roll away nest boxes, because unlike uh, you folks in America, you're not allowed to wash eggs in Europe. So you must have clean eggs. You can't I know that you have to wash eggs over there, but we're not allowed to wash eggs. Simple infrastructure for moving water around the farm to keep animals on the move. So all the animals are moving daily around. And during this, uh, so we spend about $220,000 with a plan to pay that back in five years. And the farm is producing about $275,000 of crops in the short sort of five, six month production season that we have. We have very long winters here, so the hens go inside, and that's a deep litter system. They get sold as stewing hens, and then in the spring, in about May time, they uh, come out, a new flock replaces them. We put a thousand tomatoes in there. And then our other main enterprise is a no-dig market garden. We've just been listening to uh, talk about no-till. We do no-till vegetable production, very intensive, small scale, with wood chip pathways and mushroom production edible mushrooms in the pathways all started in this very cheap like it, the key thing about our farms we've built everything up at very low cost using scrap materials and things we find this is a lean to greenhouse where we actually start in our seeds and today is the first day of seeding here in sweden so if that gives you any context of the season using simple tools appropriate technology for very efficient uh, high production market gardening and we'll be talking a lot more about this uh, it's in, a, in 45 minutes time. So I'll show you a lot more slides then. We're doing micro queens as well. And yeah, this is what the farm looks like seven years in. And you can find out a bunch more. We put a lot of stuff on YouTube, etc., that you can find out if you're interested. 
Thank you so much. And we're going to we're going to keep introducing the farmers and then um, we will definitely have time for the panel questions that you guys all might have. Um, next, we are going to go to Liz Brownlee. Liz and Nate Brownlee are a nightfall, nightfall farm in southern southeastern Indiana. They work on rotational grazing with sheep, pigs, ducks, or not ducks, chickens and turkeys. Uh, they have a 50 member CSA. Uh, on 13 acres of converted to pasture land that used to be in corn and soybeans. And they are um, the, the lead, the, the president of the Hoosier Young Farmer Coalition, one of uh, the farmer groups that is very near and dear to my heart. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to you, Liz. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so you guys, thanks so much for having me be a part of this. Um, you know, I know that um, SARE is the sponsor for this session of workshops today about regenerative ag and um, I just want to give them a shout out because a lot of what we've been able to do and what I want to share with you about today is focused on um, things we learned from their grant funding. So um, I'm just going to dive right in. Um, Tamara shared that. Um, let's see. There we go. Um, Tamara shared sort of what we raise, um, but there's one more component of it, um, which is people. Um, because one of the regenerative ag techniques um, that we really think is important is bringing people back onto the land and connecting people with their food. And so this little guy in the left corner is now like a, a teenager who would be super embarrassed to see this photo <laughs> here. Um, he's a CSA member and their, their families get meat from us every single month. Um, and, and we try to bring people onto the farm as much as we can, partly through the Hoosier Young Farmers Coalition work as well. Um, and that's been really important to us because we're in a rural community um, where a lot of the land looks like this. This is probably pretty familiar to you all. It's um, it's flat, it's open, and it's corn and soybeans. And um, when we moved home um, eight years ago now, um, back to Indiana, after working on farms in the Northeast, we said, we want to turn it into something productive and abundant. And, um, and that means um, bringing these rural communities back to life and bringing the soil back to life is a big piece of that. So we started with 13 acres and that 13 acres is doing really well. Um, so um, that's where we raise most of our animals. And right now we're tackling adding another um, 35 acres of silvo pasture this time. And we're doing that because uh, the land and our animals told us to. Um, the, the sheep that we raise, we were just buying in feeder sheep at first. And there's this one portion of, of um, an old hay field where my brother had planted a bunch of bur oaks um, and we just decided to graze the sheep there one day. We were kind of out of space. It was really hot. We wanted the shade and they loved it. And we realized very quickly they were happier and we were happier. And around here, these bur oaks, um, they're actually called cow oaks because the cows love to eat them um, and graze on the bottom leaves and the sheep do too. Um, and so we said, great, when we plant more trees, we're going to include bur oaks because they do well in our soils and the sheep love them. Um, the other lesson we got from our animals in the land is persimmons. Um, they do super well in our wet, poor soils around here. Um, and so we um, we were harvesting some persimmons for ourselves, um, and we just gave the seeds to the pigs, you know, the leftovers after we had cleaned them up. And the pigs suck the seeds clean. They love the persimmons. They're just little sugar bombs, right? We, that's why we love them, too. Um, and so we said, great, we're going to plant more persimmons. And so that's what we're doing right now. We've got a silver pasture establishment um, where we've involved people in the plantings. This is a group of college students that helped with a group a, a day of planting. We bring in neighbors and CSA members to help us plant and we get a lot more done and people have a good time and have a sense of accomplishment and they want to know how the trees are growing, you know. Um, and I'm happy to report that some of the trees are doing really well. Um, <laughs> so this picture is from just a couple of days ago. We went out and um, this is, tree is three years old mm -hmm. now. Uh, it's a sugar maple. We will probably never harvest the uh, sap from this tree, but someone will. And that's sort of all that matters. Um, so we've planted about a thousand trees on the farm now. And um, the idea is to get uh, minimum shade, but hopefully, you know, products we can sell and, and forage for our animals. Um, and I just want to add in here that um, a SAIR grant, if you guys are wanting to know more about silvo pasture establishment, we were a site for a SAIR grant research project. Um, and we learned a number of things. It looks like um, maybe the text is a little wonky there, but one, on-farm research is really fun. We're nerds and we totally enjoyed it. Um, but two, um, they were testing out well, how do you establish trees within a pasture actively grazing? And they've got some really good data about what worked on our farm here in Indiana, but like four other farms throughout the Midwest. Um, last thing I'll say is 
the new project on our farm is um, we actually have a veggie farm that has started on our land and we're really pumped about this because we think this is a regenerative practice um, because we don't have time for everything but we do have a lot of fertility from our animals and the veggie farmers have expertise about how to um, care for the soil and and raise really good food so we're teaming up and they actually just got a SARE grant a farmer rancher grant to um, look at biodigesters from our spent bedding um, and their expertise turning it into really good compost so we're pumped about that and um, excited to have more people on the land. I think up next is Nick Carter. He's going to talk about uh, the farm that he had in his SARE grant. He's the CEO, I think, of the Market Wagon, um, which is something we maybe not going to talk a lot about, but also something to definitely look into. It's a pretty cool program. So, well, first of all, yeah, great segue. I, I think I'm only on this panel because I completed a Farmer Rancher SARE grant, and I'm going to be just sharing in my brief show here what we did and what we learned, um, I feel like I'm way underqualified to be a regenerative ag uh, panelist. Uh, we are just getting started. My farm is um, on the northeast side of Indianapolis. We have 20 acres. We run a farm stand. So we are lucky enough to live right among uh, a massive population of consumers. So we run an on, on farm stand where uh, about 90% of our stuff is sold right there. We don't have to go to market or anything else. It's, and we do, the, the other 10% is market wagon, as you mentioned. Um, uh, but I am a uh, fourth generation Indiana farmer. I, I mentioned earlier in a question, my dad farms, um, he was doing no-till before no-till was cool. And um, so I learned from him and he is, we are together converting the 80 acre home front, just like um, the Mosiers, we're doing the same thing. It was corn and soy, we're converting that into um, grass fed beef and, and pork production. We can't have beef and pork because we were technically in, inside of Indianapolis city limits. And so that's a class one livestock, not allowed here. Uh, but we have goats and um, chickens. And so what we did with the SARE research uh, of our 20 acres, 16 of it is in certified forest, with, which is a DNR program in Indiana. Um, and <laughs> one of the key tenets of that program is that you're trying to restore native hardwoods. But this forest is is just completely overridden with honeysuckle and also multiflora rose and a few other invasives, just invasives that just destroy the understory. So our SARE grant was um, designed to see if we could uh, eradicate that with purpose, right? I mean, there's it's hard to ask a farmer to go out and spend a lot of time eradicating an invasive species if there's not really a monetary value to it. So um, one of the issues is I know a lot of people probably use uh, chips, chip drop, but there's concern around like alleliopathy, other things that are going on in chip drop. Um, honeysuckle is one of them that can actually sprout from green trimmings, just like sycamore and some other things. Um, so we were going to mulch this, and it's alleliopathic, um, or is believed to be. There's not been a lot of primary research on it, but um, the, the the leaf droppings and the trimmings from it appear to be alleliopathic in, in nature. So why put that on your garden, right? So we um, decided we could use sweet corn as sort of our oh, um, test bed. We do a lot of sweet corn here, and um, uh, we could see if this was going to impact germination rates because... Um, well, first of all, corn is pretty hardy and it has a really standard germination rate, so you know what it should be. Um, and so we can uh, run test plots and see what we were going to do. What we, we we expanded it a little bit. So what we did was we harvested the honeysuckle and brought it for the goats to eat. And then we would chip what was left, right? So the goats uh, loved it. They dug into it. Um, they would eat, uh, eat these things down in like a day. They'd have them picked completely clean. And then we took the branches that remained, chipped those, and used that chip for our, our deep litter. So um, we don't move our chickens over pasture right now. Um, we use deep litter in a, a fixed um, house and then we, we have unique ways of getting green matter for them to eat um, throughout the year. But then we we uh, we also use the Johnson Sioux composter. And of course we spread that onto uh, the fields um, and we use a test plot, you know, so we spread uh, this like 90% honeysuckle chip um, over about an acre. And then the other acre we just just did conventionally, and um, the germination was about the same, right? So we we didn't have any kinds of issues that would suggest alleliopathy preventing germination of the seeds. Um, and the honeysuckle was not a bad forage, especially if you are like we are, we're we're supplying um, some protein supplement, and also uh, there's plenty of other forage that they have. We have a lot of pastures, um, so it's a pretty low crude, crude protein, but it didn't have high sulfur. It wasn't hard on the rumen. They enjoyed it. As you know, goats like browse. The problem was the labor. <laughs> so 
Um, I tried my best to figure out uh, uh, an equivalency to actual forage here. What you see here took about two hours to harvest. And if you really boiled it down to the leaves themselves that the goats were going to mostly eat, it's about three bales of hay. So it just doesn't pencil out to actually go out and harvest this stuff. So then we, we called an audible in the middle of the, the grant project and we decided to actually go. Oh, the other other problem is, by the way, when you cut these honeysuckle out of the forest floor and you can paint the crap out of that stump with all the brush killer you want, um, it's coming back. As a matter of fact, uh, so they, they spread subterranealy, right? So we were not actually eradicating it. So the audible we called was to just to start grazing. Uh, we had to get a special permit from the DNR because they, to date, they don't allow you to graze in certified forest. Um, but we worked out with the DNR. They gave us um, a, a permit to do this as an experimental basis. And what the goats are doing now is they're coming to where the honeysuckle is and, and they are defoliating, right? This is a one day. It's really amazing to watch a goat graze on browse. They, they will stick their tongues out. They'll grab the leaves and then they'll defoliate which we believe will have as much of an impact at, at killing this in the long run. It's going to take a lot longer as herbicide will, because if you radic if you just completely defoliate that plant time and time again throughout the growing season, don't allow it to put out um, any propagate any of its own seed or berries. Um, we should have we should have good results. That's what we are, are hoping for. So that's what we do. Um, and of course, we have the sweet corn, as I mentioned, we have uh, 400 layers. We have uh, 12 brood um goats they are meat goats um i grew up on a dairy i never want to do that again <laughs> and uh, we've got another couple of acres of produce um diverse i mean peppers tomatoes uh cucumbers and, and the like and that's our farm and what what we want to do now is we have 30 minutes to ask questions to these amazing farmers um kind of from all over the world we get to say today um all over indiana and sweden um, I do have some questions, but if others have questions, um, please put them in the chat or you can uh, jump on and, and just say your question here. Um, one question is, where can we get more information about Sarah Grant, Nick? Um, Lace McCartney, I don't know if she's on. Uh, I don't know, Nick, if you want to talk about it or, or Liz and Nate, both of you. There's um, Lace. It's, it's surprisingly easy. Um, go to... Uh, I think it's just NC, well, in the Northeast, in the, in the North Central region, it's ncsayer.org, um, or just Google North Central Sayer. Um, right on there, go and look for, uh, what we did was the farmer rancher grants. Um, they're, they're relatively small. They can't be used for permanent equipment, but they cover, they basically take out the risk of, of loss from, you know, you're going to do something stupid, right? You're going to you're going to do something that you wouldn't ordinarily risk the time and money to go out and try and do. Um, and I've I've now completed over the course of the last ten years, my dad and I combined have done um, four different um, projects, and each time we've learned a ton, and it's it's really really been good. I'm going to I'm going to throw a softball for all of you guys. And if you all just kind of answer it, it's the first question I sent you out. What's one or two practices that you've adopted that has really improved the health of your soil? And how were you able to tell by, you know, adopting it that your soil changed and kind of what did you notice that was different? Um, let's start with Joanne. OK, so. Well, the biggest thing was was putting the the grass species out there that turning it into the pastures. We had a lot of it's crazy because we had a, a serious weed issue. The Palmer amaranth um, started taking over our farm when we were doing corn and soybeans and we were literally like um, walking through the, the soybean fields and pulling them by hand just to try to to get the Palmer amaranth out of there because nothing was taking care of it. And so when we turned that um, that pasture specifically in into just a pasture um then it we didn't spray anything we just started grazing and so the mouths would get down there and graze it while it was little and the the animals didn't care they just ate it and so now you go out and look in our pasture i don't think I actually, I don't think I've seen any i know i haven't seen any large palmer, palmer amaranth but so um yeah just that grazing and um, putting the multi-species out there was just huge as far as our weed pressure. So I just know when the, the weeds are going away, the soil and everything is is happy. Yummy, yummy stuff. So cool. Yeah. Richard? Uh, 
yeah i can i can echo that that point as well it's fun um i think like a major shift for me is like really understanding that you know we're we're farming microbes like if you're focused on vegetables or chickens or cows you're kind of missing the most fundamental bits and what i've seen through our approach with plant grazing and just always managing so carefully not to overgraze grasses the resilience and the diversity and the health of and vigor of plants is just incredible to see i've been documenting that that people can see on youtube if they're interested over a, you know a long period of time and then the same is is true in our vegetable gardens like the only pest and disease issues we've had in our entire market garden operations is is rust spots on beet leaves <laughs> which is not even a big deal and it's testimony to a healthy micro population essentially and so i think that yeah putting priority and focus on the on the right thing is is been the biggest influential thing in my practice that's really given me confirmation that we're doing the right thing and it, it, I always like to say, like, nature's going this way or it's going that way. It's moving in exponential, like, life and decay are equal opposing forces moving in an exponential pattern, you could say. And once you put a few pieces of that jigsaw together, you can hopefully be humble enough to step back and get out the way. And that's kind of a critical role of a farmer, I think, as well, opposed was... to sort of modern technicians that, that I was taught at ag school. <laughs> That was pretty philosophical. I I will definitely say we're going to be using that one on our next promotion of this conference next year. So thank you. Um, Liz and Nate, you want to go next? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, we we did all the things that are on the list, right? You're, you're supposed to use cover crops when you're converting land uh, into pasture these days, and you're supposed to plant a diverse fix, and now we're adding the trees. Um, I don't think anything we're doing is um, rocket science per se, but I think we are getting some really good indications from the land that it's starting to work, which is really exciting. So that's what I wanted to share with you guys. Like we um, we see more insect life all the time, like uh, dragonflies, for instance, which I get really pumped about because they eat mosquitoes. Um, but the the other um, insect that we're seeing that tells us like, oh, there's a whole functioning ecosystem happening now um, is a couple of summers ago now, we saw our first carrion beetles. And these are these really big beetles with like bright yellow on their backs. And I saw them and thought, oh no, it's like some pest I've never heard of. And this is bad. What is this thing? And we noticed it was it was um, on one of the paths we walk in our pasture uh, on like a dead bowl or something like that that we had probably hit while we like drove feet out or something like that. And we were watching it and they were all over this dead thing. There were a bunch of them. We went inside and looked it up and it turns out they're a really positive indicator. They only show up when there are dead things that need to be decomposed. Um, so they're present in places that have manure and and functioning um, detritivore action. And that just made us feel really good. Like, oh, <laughs> this is working. Um, these practices are are showing up in the soil um, in ways we don't even understand yet. We were still learning, you know. Awesome. Nick, there's a bunch of questions to Nick in the chat if you want to want to um, answer some of those at some point. Um, I've been trying to, to keep up with those. Um, somebody's yeah. been asking a lot about goats and they're definitely escape artists. You've got to train the kids young to the electric fence. If you don't, they will not respect it when they get older. Um, but hot wire can contain goats. Don't believe anybody who says that they can't. It's just gotta be hot. We went to Rural, uh, Rural King. We got the one that was rated for elk. We figured that ought to do it. Um, you just gotta shock the crap out of it. Um, what have we done to improve soil here? So, I mean, I'm only three years in here at, at this farm, at Mud Creek Farm. I will, I just want to share a quick stat. I mean, my dad, um, he was getting teased for no-till in the 80s, right? And um, the, he, he's kept all of his soil tests going way, all the way back. And we averaged about 1.9% organic matter when he made this change. And most of his fields, I mean, he's still doing, by the way, guys, he's doing production grain cropping. I've had to teach him and try to pull him along into some of this new stuff. But even in those production crop fields, he's at about three to three and a half percent organic matter. Um, that took 25 years 
Uh, but there's results going there. Here on our farm, I got a couple of things that I wanted to share. One is, I mean, some of you might be thinking sweet corn, monoculture, that's not regenerative. And one of the things about farming is you gotta sell what people wanna buy and we're right in the heart of the city. And I can plop, uh, you know, a hundred dozen sweet corn out on a table by the by the road and, and make a thousand dollars in a day. So we do that. Um, but we, we move it around. We also chop and drop it, right? So when, once we picked it, I have a bush hog, I go out, and um, basically and bush hog it down and let that sit. And that has helped to suppress weeds that would come up um, over time. We run the goats over the, the garden when it's all done in the winter time, you know, in the fall. Um, and another little thing that I thought of as I was thinking about this question, Tamara, was maybe counterintuitive, but um, my, my dad, again, he's the guy that taught me to farm. I'm 37 years old, I'll still talk about like, dad's teaching me how to farm, we never stop learning. And he was here helping me get this set up. It was fallow land when we when we bought it. Um, and the first year there was one section that was sort of at a, it's bottom ground. It was sort of at a delta of a tributary coming down the hill on its way to a creek. And it's, so it's floodplain, it's a hundred year floodplain. So it does get standing water every now and then. And, and in that area in our first year, uh, we had just horrible germination through this area. And the reason you guys could probably figure out is compaction, right? Standing water on silt ground over the course of the 40 years that this place had been completely untouched. Um, it was that that soil was so compact. Um, there was no oxygen in it. There wasn't microbial life underneath it because it was just concrete, right? It was it was really compacted. And so contrary to what I mean, even even I mean I ha I, I literally I, he the first thing his dad says you're gonna have to put a plow to it and I was like you have to teach me because before I could drive a tractor you went no till so guess who's never learned how to put a plow to the ground so we put plowshares down and we deep ripped it um, and then disked it down and also um, rerouted some of the drainage right so we had, we put a ditch in and rerouted drainage so that it wouldn't get a lot of the heavy setting standing water will compact soil really really fast and so I, I think that that tied into kind of what Ray was talking about, right? The timing and knowing when you need to disturb. And in that situation, we had to rip it. We had to start over. We had to pull it up and get oxygenation going in there and undo the compaction. So don't don't feel like a plow is like sin. Um, yeah. You just got to know what you're doing with it. Why you're using it. Thank you so much, Nick. That was really helpful. I think there's a lot that you kind of, you know, reiterated what Ray was saying as well. I think you guys really matched up. Um, there's a question that says, for all of you, what is the most profitable product you produce? Richard, do you want to go first? Well, it's it's a difficult one. I, the whole focus of my book was doing a comparative analysis of all of the different enterprises that you might employ on a small farm, the most profitable of which is pasture turkeys for us. But we don't have a market here. I mean, people don't eat turkey like they do in England where I grew up. Um, but all of our enterprises are kind of running at a similar scale. I'd say time input wise, it would be the pasture meat birds that will generate the most income. Okay. Nick, you want to go next? Yeah. My most profitable is, uh, the eggs. Um, that that's the most profitable enterprise we have on the farm. If you want to know my most profitable crop, it's, it's sweet corn. Um, it's actually oh. pretty low labor, pretty low input if you're doing it right. Interesting. Liz and Nate? Uh, exact same as Richard. So the turkeys are number one. And thankfully, we do have a really good market. Thanksgiving treats us very well. And I would say even if you're in a on a very small piece of land, think about 10 to 12 turkeys because they're really good for the ground. They're excellent foragers. And people will pay a premium for a turkey at Thanksgiving uh, for a special meal, you know, that they might not for just a Tuesday night dinner. Um, and then the pastured uh, broilers is right behind that for us. And I'm, cool. I'm seeing these comments about Thanksgiving and Christmas and whether they work or not as a marketing tool. And, you know, um, just having ground turkey as an option mm -hmm. to sell at the farmer's market extends that interest from customers beyond. And we don't see much of it from our other vendors. And so we can ask for a good price on it uh, because, it, you know, it it becomes more expensive to part out the turkey uh, but then you know there's not much competition yet and so it is able to get what we would need to match the profit levels of a whole bird um, and then yeah again the, the the meat chickens like Richard mentions they um, we didn't want to be chicken farmers uh, but <laughs> but they just make a ton of sense for what we are doing uh, it's a quick turnaround customers are used to chickens 
And because of both of those reasons, that's what we do the most of. Mm -hmm. And so that that becomes, you know, a key factor in what is most profitable, uh, you know, scale. And they're also really important for our pasture. Um, the fertility that they leave behind is, is critical to trying to rebuild these really, you know, um, heavy clay soils. Cool. Joanne. So I would say probably the most profitable product of our farm has been our children. Um, free labor <laughs> is awesome. <laughs> and they get work experience. So, it, you know, it's it's a win-win. So, yeah. But no, um, so, but that's our, I mean, number one, that's best. But as far as like products that we move off of the farm, um, our grass-fed ground beef is probably the most profitable when we harvest some of the more mature animals that aren't necessarily our prime um, cut ones. And we harvest some of the other ones and we just grind those. But because of how processing has been this last year, year and a half, um, we have had to um, to add an on-farm butcher shop to be able to make that a continued profit because otherwise it was like we wouldn't be able to do anything so um, so yeah that has been that has been very profitable for us okay and I'm just going to let this one open to any of you that want to answer what advice do you all have for those of us who are unlikely to raise animals especially like small urban gardens but still want to maintain good soil health Something I would love to do and haven't figured out yet is worms. Um, Nate was actually on a trip up to Wisconsin that Purdue led, and they got to see Will Allen set up with um, urban uh, vermicomposting, and I got totally excited about it, and, and then it got to the bottom of the list. So I would say I think that's one way to have um, fertility happening on a, in a very small space. Um, and, you know, it, it's hard for us to take animals out of the equation because that's what we built everything on, but... Um, that puts me in the mindset of being closer to towns and, and urban areas. And one of the things that I've been jealous of from other farmers that have access to those population centers is, you know, schmoozing with the resources you have and, you know, get the people that are vacuuming leaves off the street to dump them in your farm. Uh, you know, like take advantage of the resources that you have that aren't animals. You, you can find organic matter and, um, you know, it comes with, you know, the bummers of like shredded up water bottles and stuff from the cruise because they just toss them in there with it as well. But, um, you know, you, you've got access to things that we don't even, you know, having animals here mm -hmm. in the in the, the country. And you might check out the um, SARE. So the SARE website is neat if you want to do a project, right? You want to do on-farm research, but they also have a database. Um, and I think someone posted in the chat, like all the projects that have happened in Indiana recently. Uh, but you can look all around the country. You can see what farmers are up to. And so there's some research about you know, yeah, using leaf uh, leaves or grass clippings or things like that to try to build fertility from sort of scavenged sources. If you're in an urban area, you got to be careful about grass clippings because of what's coming with it on the chemicals. Um, but I'll, I'll put a plug in for Chip Drop. Um, and if you've not heard of it, Chip Drop. I think it's Chip Drop. Com. You just sign up, and your name gets put on a list that they they publish out to arborists, right? Who are they're out there chipping up wood. They have to pay to drop that wood at a place that's going to turn it into mulch and then sell the mulch to landscapers the next year, which I don't know, I'm in the wrong business, apparently. If you, if you get paid to take in your raw material and then you sell the, sell it later. But uh, of course, what a lot of people are cautious about with chip drop is like we talked about, you don't know what's in it. You get poison ivy, you'll get sycamore, you'll get things that can sprout from the, the um, green shoots. So um, what, I mean, I can't say I've proven it, but what we've tried to demonstrate here is let it sit for a year, right? So compost the chips, right? Let them sit and rot and then use them next year. Don't be in a hurry to put it on your garden. And that that will alleviate a lot of those risks. That was a great idea. Never thought about that. I've. You're right, though. They're trying to get rid of chips. Um, Richard or Joanne, do you have anything else? Otherwise, I'll go on to another. Sure. Before. I I do. I yeah. It's just it's interesting hearing Nick say that. I forgot how uh, you love to use or generally in America use a lot more chemicals now. And it, the statistics of how much ag chemicals go onto lawns it's it's quite unfamiliar and here in europe we don't we, people value their lawns but they're not dosed in chemicals in the same way i think but it's it's really easy to you know it, it, i come from england where we have allotments and an allotment was what a family was allotted to produce their own food it's a very small space most people have a backyard bigger than that it's very easy to grow a family's food in a very small space like self-sustainability is very very 
easeful compared to farming for a living where you have regulations and economy coming in. But you can easily bring in you know, the idea of worms for composting your food scraps. You can bring in municipal compost. You can use wood chips. We love to, you know, I got taught no dig market gardening with people like Charles Dowding, who pioneered that in the UK. We integrated that with wood chips so that we would have totally clean workspaces to be able to walk around in you know shoes in even in saturated weather conditions that we have in the spring and you can add perennial vegetables to that you can add trees or bushes if you have space if you've got a bit of a bigger yard you can add a couple of hens and have all your eggs it's it's really not so much work to produce the family's food needs and if you wanted to make an enterprise on a tiny scale and you have a marketplace there's, there's all kinds of options like microgreens if you're in an urban population and you have access to chefs, et cetera, you can make a living in a tiny greenhouse, you know, 13, 14, 15 feet by 10 feet, you know? So it's it depends. There's a lot needs unpacking in there, but it's you can do a lot in a tiny space, and you can really close your little nutrient loops of your of your family house. So it's a, it's a really nice thing to be able to do. That was great. Joanne, do you want to offer anything else? Otherwise, I'll go on to another question. No, go ahead. I just reiterate, we've used wood chips in a few areas where we weren't, where we were trying to improve the area. And uh, it, it's just amazing. After, I think we have a pile that's been there 10 years. And it's just, um, it's just amazing how that has broken down. And it went from really tall pile to just breaking down naturally on its own with just some vegetation on it and just turning itself into yummy soil. So, yeah. Good stuff. And can I add one thing to that? I see there's a comment saying, um, you know, I, I, it's harder to get wood chips. Um, we've noticed that some of the towns around us also have wood chip setups where you can just go and fill up a bucket or your pickup. Or we've taken our livestock trailer and filled it up when we needed a bunch at once. And none of the arborists around us had any and none of the power companies did. So um, you might check into the municipalities around you. Um, it's not as awesome as having it dropped on your place, <laughs> but um, it might might um, suffice. And when you talk about getting it dropped on your place and, and letting it sit, because that is a really good idea if you have that ability, if you have that space. Um, it's our easiest place for arborists to back up to and drop their uh, chips is right across from our neighbor's porch. And so we've had to deal with the uh, realities of having neighbors staring at wood chip piles and education, you know, what that means and how that's a good thing for them as well as for us. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's all pieces of the puzzle. Super. I wonder, I'd love to add to that just because <laughs> someone was asking in the questions of like uh, what we've started doing is taking King's Drafaria, the wine cap mushroom, and you can inoculate that into the pile of wood chips while it sits as well. And when you spread that out as pathways around the garden, you get a like, 20% yield from those mushrooms over the next four or five years. So, you know, we're putting down 50 cubic meters of chips every five years. You can produce, in the garden our scale, you can produce a couple of tons of edible mushrooms. And the way that mushrooms have evolved with humans and animals is that they pop up along the sides of pathways, naturally, where the, the spores are carried. And what you find is that they don't pop up in your pathways because you're walking so it's compressed in the middle and they pop up on the edges where the crops are some go into the beds but only there for three or four days so it's not in the way of your crops that's a really nice way to do it. and they can also synthesize some you know if there's any heavy metals things like that it will help with the cleaning of that wood chip too so that's a, a fun little idea for you i love that a fun little idea <laughs> Um, okay, next one is how do you start testing or understanding what microbes you have in your soil? I do. <laughs> I've Get never done a soil microscope, a uh, simple soil microscope for about 150 bucks. You need certain things. If you look up on YouTube, you'll find people like Elaine Ingham, and you can find out the basic core needs. You basically you want binocular vision with 10 times magnification. You want 10, 20, 40 times objectives. You need a 1.25 ABBE condenser and a variable light source. And then you can make your own 400 times magnification um, slides. And then you can see for yourself what's there. You'll start to learn what the organisms look like in their movements, like protozoas and the different creatures like nematodes and bacteria, etc. 
obviously you're not seeing them in super high definition, but you learn by their movements and activities what they are. And then you can make things like compost tea out of your compost and you can see if it's worked because it's either full of life or it's not. <laughs> and because you're creating the right conditions that facilitates healthy aerobic populations, as long as you created the conditions, you know that you're creating the healthy microbes. Likewise, you can do that in your soil. So we use a, a probe. It's just a cylindrical tube that you, you take soil samples at the set depth all the time. And so every year I can document, is my pasture life increasing in diversity or in, in uh, micro population? Now, it's not super scientific in that I don't know what any of these 5,000 species of bacteria do. But all I can think is that however complex we think we understand it, it's way more complex than that. And I could give you 18 soil encyclopedias that I have on my computer, and they would still lead you to no clearer understanding of how to treat the soil than I can tell you in 20 minutes. Right? So there's a point where that information is not useful anymore. And sure, it's fun to geek out on, but you, you see with your eyes and senses if things are moving the right way in your garden or on your farm and you can measure those things for yourself that you don't need to rely on anyone outside i'm not a big fan of soil testing because i can see and observe what's happening with my plants and animals if they don't get sick like ever then something's going good right obviously it's more complex with breeding etc but it's, it's very nice to be able to measure things for yourself and deepen your own understanding so that you feel resilient and you feel clear about your decision making and what's worth your time to, to input on things. So I really recommend getting a microscope, lots of literature out there about making compost, compost teas, all that stuff. And it's really fun because you get to play physicist and biologist and chemist and, you know, that's what farming's about. Great answer. Okay, I have another question. How have you built community on a local level around your mission and connecting people to the land and local food sources? Liz, do you guys want to talk about that first? Um, I think the we have invested a lot of time in this question. Um, we we really felt strongly when we moved home that we did not want to um, sell into the urban markets, but we wanted to serve the smaller farmers markets around us um, because you know we have several farmers markets within 20 to 35 minutes, as opposed to driving an hour and a half or two hours. And um, that has meant that we've had to pull our community into conversation. Um, so how have we how have we done that? We've been serving on the farmers market committees. That's one way. If you are not serving on your committee, go and do that. It's a lot of um, frustrating conversations and a lot of worthwhile conversations. Um, and, and that can be one way that you can leverage um, community resources to get people talking about food. Um, we have events on our farm, especially for our CSA members, not right now, but, um, you know, uh, we're lambing right now and our plan had been last year and this year to um, have an open barn day where people could come and see the lambs, um, things like that. We have school groups that come, letting people know that you do that, that you um, are open to some basic field trips and tours. Um, I think that can go a long way. If you have a community newspaper around you, they're always oh, looking yeah. for content. So we had written a couple, I, th I think they were letters, letters to the editor, uh, but then they just said, would you write a monthly column? And so uh, we did that for a really long time. Yeah, we did that for like five years and they actually paid us, which was amazing. I don't think they're doing that these days because <laughs> everything's so tight for newspapers. Um, but it was really great for us. It led to precisely zero sales, yeah. but everybody would come to the market and say, we love reading about your farm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, it makes me think about how my grandfather used to do this, or I'm so glad you're doing that. And so it was an engagement that was incredibly easy on our end. Mm -hmm. And it was a good excuse to sit down once a month and say like, how's it going? What's, what's working right now? What's not? That reflection was really useful. Um, so, and they've got a new farmer doing it now, which is really neat. Somebody who's in like year two. So, um, that's been a good piece of the puzzle for us. Um, I think those are some of the like low hanging fruit that we've been tackling. Um, we're near a, a college as well. So we're, we've taken advantage of having classes come out, mm -hmm. uh, having work, work days and events, um, teaching things. So those... Yeah. That's the other thing. So I would say, don't be afraid to have people come work on your farm. It's a double edged sword for sure. Um, but I really feel strongly that me, people need meaningful work. Um, we all, I think a lot of people in this world 
sit at a computer or do something they don't believe in because it has a paycheck and they have to. So to have an opportunity to do something that is tangible and has an end result that they can see um, really sticks with people. Um, my advice there would be that when people say they want to come work on your farm, what they mean is they would like to come work for two to four hours and then hang out <laughs> on the porch and <laughs> drink a cup of tea. Um, they don't want to work a 12 hour, 15 hour day like you need to, um, but that's okay. Um, there, cause there are other benefits to having them there. So. Joanne, do you want to talk about what you're doing? Sure. So, um, we have, um, several, on farm field days, I guess, or on farm days where people come and um, we um, we have a so we have a really large um, customer base. I have like a large email news list and we email newsletters <laughs> when I'm on it. Um, uh, we email newsletters biweekly and so they're used to hearing from us. There's always things of what's going on with um, with the farm and so we stay in touch with these newsletters and it just is amazing how these people um i might not have ever met the, any of these people um well okay i've met some people but i haven't met all of these people and then they will they just follow our story and they're there and they're listening but um we we haven't had that face-to-face -face interaction but it amazes me like five years later all of a sudden somebody knows me so well and you know knows our farm knows what we're doing they're excited about the beef and um and all they did was just read our newsletter every now and then over the past so many years they just hang with us on that adventure but we do do um we outreach through different farm events we'll have um, like a pasture tours where we load everybody on the hay wagon and the kids drive the tractor through well my kids drive the tractor through the pastures and um they get to interact with the animals you know we'll call the cows up and and it, it people love it because there's a lot of people that come to the farm and say wow this is the first time i ever really saw a beef you know close up um or first time i've ever really seen you know touched a baby lamb um so it's i don't know just having including them on the adventure and having like uh and just simple things everything and just staying in contact with them all the time um has helped as far as that community as far as our local community we've um you know sponsored we've donated meats to different um like the the volunteer fire department and different things like that so that the there's an we're outreached we have a lot of signage so people local can come in and ask questions um and then we hire a bunch um not a bunch but we hire local people and a lot of retired people because they they like to work and they're fun to be around um and so we just kind of reach out to our local community as far as um, donating time or um, coming and helping us do different projects. So yeah, the people is, I mean, we're doing this for the land, we're doing this for, you know, for food, but it ultimately the people is, I, I think is the most important part, so. Great, thank you, thank you both. Nick, do you wanna um, just chime in and then we'll end up with Richard and then I think we're done for the day. For, for this session, sorry, not the day. Um, yeah, I mean, we are, we're very fortunate that, you know, we, I think in the mile radius around here, there's, there's like 10,000 homes. I mean, we're in the middle of, of Indy. It, so, um, we've held tours, we have our farm stand, we see people out there all the time. Um, we've actually had a little bit of the opposite problem. I don't know if this is where we want to go or just, I'll, I'll just mention it, you know, um, we're on 20 acres. Our house is about uh, 120, 130 yards away through the woods from the chicken barn. And uh, my oldest is 11 years old and they, they take care of the animals. Like I don't, I don't, they go down there daily. They're doing chores. Um, so we have people that have decided uh, we're a park and they've given self-guided tours. So when random strangers meet my kids unattended on our own private property, that's been problematic. Um, not in a, not in a serious way, but like we, we have to teach our kids, you know, safety and things like that. And, and, and so we've actually had to put up, unfortunately, uh, cameras and no trespassing signs. And I hate it, um, but we, we can't have we cannot have unfettered access to our private property where my kids go and play and work. Um, so I, that's probably completely in the opposite direction. But we, we've had a struggle with that of people feeling way too connected to this land. Um, so hmm, that's interesting. Yeah, thank you.
Richard, let's start, end with you, and then um, we're going to be signing off because you need to get over to your other um, keynote speech. But, you know, it's interesting to hear your perspective from Sweden. How do you guys connect to your communities? Mm, well, I can say uh, I've got a bit of a similar situation as, as Nick because we're quite a public site and do a lot of education work and have a very outward-facing element to what we do. So we, we also get that thing of people sort of feeling like they can you know I've come out at six in the morning and there's photographers taking photos for a newspaper in the back of my around the back of my house and it's you know and then when I ask them to leave they're like upset that I haven't got time to talk with them and it's like you're gonna get slapped if you don't get out of here because you you know how would you feel if I come around the back of your house and take photos for your window and so it's it's a funny territory. Certainly, if you have an outward facing element and educational community element, then it, that's something that comes with the territory. So, echoing what everyone else has said, we have open days, but we're very very strict about hey, these open days are free. We'll feed you. We'll spend all day walking around, showing you around. We'll get old ladies in their nineties crawling, looking at the bugs in cow manure, and getting super excited about something they've never thought about before. But it's like it's on our terms. It's on this day and this day, maybe even three days a year. But you are not welcome to show up anytime outside of that because it's just not how we do. And the, the way that we build community through sales is we do drop off points. And but that also works on our terms. It's not on the farm. It's in locations in three different local towns. And we turn up for 45 minutes and drop off all our products. And so we get that little bit of customer interaction, which is all that's needed to create food security when you have a relationship with your customers but doesn't have to take too long that i have to hear about mrs jones's cats because frankly i don't care about her cats like i need to get home and feed chickens you know so we we maintain community through through constant interaction but very short and just a smile and looking in their eyes that's enough you know and and that's worked well for a time management perspective for us as well Super. Well, I just want to say thank you again, everyone. Go to your emojis. I uh, just want to send a huge applause out to you, uh, all four of you, for what you're doing. Um, you know, thankful for, for all of the, um, you know, sharing that you gave to us today. Um, you know, hopefully the rest of you that were listening felt like you got some questions answered and you can start working towards uh, having a more regenerative farm. And so again, just thank you all, all four of you for spending all this, this hour with us. Appreciate it.